Now for today's program. Joan Nathan is the author of 12 cookbooks, including her latest work, My Life in Recipes, Food, Family, and Memories. Her books, Jewish Cooking in America and The New American Cooking, both won James Beard Awards and IACP Awards. Mm. Joan is a regular contributor to the New York Times and other publications, including articles for Moments Talk of the Table. Robert Siegel was the senior host of NPR's award-winning evening news magazine, All Things Considered, for 30 years. He was awarded the Edward Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award in Journalism and has been honored with three silver batons from Alfred I. DuPont, Columbia University, as well as the American Bar Association's Silver Gavel Award. Robert is a special contributor to Moment Magazine and serves on the advisory board for Moment's Daniel Pearl Investigative Journalism Initiative. Please welcome Joan Nathan and Robert Siegel. Hi, hey, Robert. Hello, Joan. Uh, and uh, let me first say what a delight it is to talk with you. Uh, I, even though uh, I am a culinary ignoramus, uh, it was suggested that I that I do this interview, and I I would never decline an opportunity to to chat with Joan Nathan. You've you've, you've written a cookbook, which is to say there are a lot of recipes, but they're organized according to your life, where you encountered these foods, whether it was just as a child or at work or later in your life as a as a food writer and as as a chef, and I was surprised to read how varied your work life was as a, as a young person uh, before you connected with food. You were not someone who said at the age of eleven, "I'm going to be a cook. I'm going to be a food writer." I'm I I wouldn't that that wasn't you, right? Well, first of all, it's a memoir and a cookbook. That's mm-hmm. uh, that's the most important thing. So it's about my life. And um, and the stories of my life and food that comes into it, um, but as oh I don't have I have to go get a copy of my book. But as the very beginning of my book says, I'll, I'll run and get one. Um, maybe you can read it because maybe you're Robert Siegel, where it says at the very beginning, it says why I became a, a, a food writer in a way. That's the very beginning of the book. What it says is when. Um, I, I found this quote from my mother. My mother collected everything from my life and from her life. And um, basically it said that I, I like to organize birthday parties for the other children when I was two years old. And um, I always liked my morning lunch. And then basically it said that uh, most of the time, the children liked it when I organized things for them, but occasionally they quibbled and they, they were, you know, just, they didn't like my bossiness. And I thought, oh, I haven't changed at all. <laughs> so basically, um, you know, it's, that, that's what my life was like. Yes. She is quite self-sufficient. Right. Your, your teacher wrote, uh, she enjoys the routine and is quite happy in her busy little way. There you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I love something that you wrote, that you said that uh, your father was given to taking seconds at, at dinner, something that your mother frowned upon, and right. that the the seating arrangement of your family dining room table, which had you next to your father, may have contributed may have, <laughs> may have contributed to your to your love of food. Right. Well, yeah, and he used to sneak the food, you know, for himself and then for me. And my mother was very proper and my brothers were on either side, both of whom are extremely thin. And um, and she was a very slow eater, but she ate everything. She loved to eat. And so my father would eat more rapidly and I was the closest to him. So I think that perhaps that's what made me like to eat and worry about it all the time. But um, anyway, but you know, it was when you see, the dinner table is an important part mm-hmm. of every child's life. And ours was always quite formal. Um, my mother would use her, her, her foot to ring the bell and a, a, a black- She had a pedal, you mean? She had, she had a- yeah, at, There was like a button at the bottom of, of the, underneath the carpet. Mm-hmm. And um, our the cook would come in with whatever she was preparing, and it, it was you know it was a mahogany table. We'd always eat in the at the, at the dining room, except when my parents weren't there. Then we'd eat in the breakfast room, 
you know, so it was pretty, and it was like liver one day, chicken on Friday night, bought challah on Friday night, um, sometimes tuna fish casserole or Salisbury steak. I'm sure yours was, you know, food yes, wise, a, yes. the same thing. It's pretty familiar, pretty familiar to me. Yeah. It was yeah. different, you know, now my, whenever I go to my kid's house and I see what, you know, what's on the table, it's a lot of pasta for these little kids. Um, and, and not just my kids, when I was going around the country on, on book tour and I met at different people, young people's uh, houses was the same thing. It's sort of like getting through a meal, you know, <laughs> surviving as parents. <laughs> I, think, I think you wrote in passing uh, in the book that uh, you mentioned that during the, I think it's during the 1980s, uh, Americans were starting to look for more in their food and their meals than uh, than just uh, survival. You know uh, uh, what? And I, it, it occurred to me that your your career has coincided with a time of a, a revolution in the way Americans think and act about food, and mm -hmm. it's a time when uh, you know uh, kids come out of uh, you know good colleges with uh, good educations and becoming a pastry chef or a, right. a, aspiring to be a restaurateur is a perfectly uh, uh, you know laudable thing to do what's been happening what 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 drove this particular revolution that you've been a part of well i think in a way the vietnam war did it when i graduated from michigan um it was you know 1965 um, it wasn't just the war, but it was also civil rights. And it was um, the, the, the uh, immigration policy was changing. It used to be just Central Europe and Eastern Europe. And then it opened it up to Asia and to Africa, South America. So palettes were able to change. I think Calvin Trilling said that this was really the the equalizer or for for so many people and 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 also there was the um peace corps mm -hmm. um, there were uh credit cards so you could have go on credit basically to european places the, i guess the diners club was the first uh, in the in the early 60s cheap travel mm -hmm. there were a lot of um, uh, chartered flights in those days. I don't know. I, my first trip to Europe was on a chartered flight from Brown University that I and another girl got onto. That was 1959, I guess. Um, you know, all things were were changing. Mm -hmm. uh, all over the country. It, you know, now they're really changing a lot more, but uh, or maybe not so much. Who knows? But, um, you know, and, and people were going abroad to places like Israel because Israel was like 15 years old then. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and seeing different places and seeing different countries and different foods. So, you know, when I, uh, before I went to Israel, I didn't even know what hummus was. Yes. And when I came back from Israel, um, I had lived there in the, in the, in the early 70s. Um, somebody tasted it and said, you know, you should give this to Zabar's. And you'd make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually, there's an exchange somewhere you have with someone about when you first learned about chickpeas. Uh, and it, it was fairly late. Uh, you know, chick, chickpeas weren't a part of the of the common American diet. Right. Well, I mean, they, they when I was at Michigan, they were called gorbanzo beans, yeah. and the, which came from the, the Spanish immigrants that brought them the Goya. They were Spanish immigrants. They brought them to the United States, and then they brought them to Michigan in big sacks, and they sold them at the farmer's market there. And um, and then this Eden products, remember Eden products? They packaged them in cans and they called them to this day gorbanzo beans. Yes. yes. Others are called chickpeas. 
but it's depend on what country it was from originally, which is kind of interesting. This brought me back, I have to tell you, to a a recurring conversation at my family dining table when I was a kid, which my father invariably referred to peas as green peas. Right. And my sister and I would for every time every time he said it say, Why do you call them green peas? They're peas. All peas are green. <laughs> and he would say, No, chickpeas are not, are are, are not. So uh, so right. this, this was a, 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 a routine that I went through many times as a, as a kid. And, but now there's, there's this friend of mine, a guy named Glenn Roberts, who is developing green chickpeas. And yes, I, 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 I read this. Um, what, one, of your, one of your jobs, you talked about going to Israel. One of your jobs after uh, college was working in Israel for the fabled mayor of Jerusalem, Teddy Kollek. Right. Uh, and uh, your job was, I guess, mostly... Being a minder uh, for uh, visiting uh, foreign reporters in, in, right. in Jerusalem, but I wonder if you can tell the story that you relate in the book about uh, Teddy Kollek, the mayor of Jerusalem, uh, taking you along on a trip to a village, I guess on the outskirts of the city, but within his jurisdiction. Uh, I'm not sure that wanted a new. It was an Arab an Arab village that where the people wanted a new road, and he decided you should join him on this particular trip. Tell tell the story. Well, um, I, I was very, it was when I first started working for Teddy and I thought he, I guess he probably wanted me to come because I'd understand what his situation was better if I went on this trip. So I went along with him and the deputy mayor, who I'm sure you've interviewed, Marin Benvenisti. And we went to this, and I, I do forget the name of the village, but it was outside of Jerusalem, and they wanted a road, a paved road. And part of the reason they wanted it was there, the, the, the village nearby, which was pretty far away, had a paved road to Jerusalem. And Teddy said that in this particular village, it was really going to cost a lot of money, and it was going to be very, very difficult to do. But Marin felt that he, as the mayor, should go visit and talk with the people. So we went together. And, and on the way, he said, Oh, I, you know, why am I doing this? I know I can't do what they want. Mm -hmm. We got there and they gave us um, some coffee, which is what you always got when you visited an Arab family. And, uh, you know, with a uh, cardamom in it. And, um, and they asked about the road and Teddy sort of skirted the issue. And then we had all this meza, this these wonderful hors d'oeuvres, hummus and baba ganoush and kibe and all kinds of things with arak. And then they brought out this huge platter of musakhan, which is my favorite chicken to this day. And it was on a big um, uh, loaf of bread, a big, huge pita, and it had sauteed red onions and pine nuts and a lot of sumac and it was just delicious and you would eat it with your hand a lot of olive oil mm -hmm. and as a result of that teddy was very happy he always liked to eat anyway i think scotty reston used to say that he would eat his food and pick it off other people's plates too <laughs> right. and, uh, um they got their they got their road. So they got the road. <laughs> I got a recipe and I got a career because I realized the power of breaking bread with people. And I honestly believe it to this day because it's more than breaking bread. You're te you're talking, the humanity within you is coming out. And I mean, you and I have had lots of meals together. Yes. And uh, I mean, I liked you before. But anyway, it, it, <laughs> the point is, you know, you're communicating with other people. And I believe it to this day. And th this pops up a couple of times in the book. I remember you were with uh, with your your late husband, Alan, on some trip he was on. And and he was having a fairly stiff exchange with, with some fellow. And then... It came time to sit down and eat. Was this in Nablus? Do I have that? Nablus. It was with the mayor of Nablus. He On the was West Bank. His, um, dissertation, the legal aspects of the military occupation of the West Bank. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, as and as 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 stiff as the first conversation was, after you sit down and and eat, uh, 
suddenly it's a di- it's a different relationship altogether. Totally, it was amazing. It was amazing. That was we didn't eat the musachan, but we did have this delicious um, dessert that was really wonderful. Um, writing a a uh, well either a memoir with recipes or for that matter any other kind of cookbook. Your your books always have tell interesting stories about the places that you're. Uh, that that you uh, where you found these dishes, but it's 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 I think it's a unique kind of of uh, of publishing, and that the test isn't just is it a good read, but do these do these recipes when when you make them when your readers follow them and make them, uh, do they work? You know, and are 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 they as they as they should be? Uh, and I've I've been fascinated with this, which is that. Is it simply when, when when a recipe goes into a book that you then publish, is it on your word? I've made this a hundred times; it works. That that it goes in, or is there some, uh, you know, publishing house uh, test kitchen where everything every, every recipe is checked out before it gets published? No, it's definitely <laughs> up to the writer and up to the writer. Up to the writer. And so, you know, sometimes it takes one time to do a recipe. Sometimes it takes 10 times. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the recipe and your discipline. I'm a little bit maybe laxer than some of the other uh, other recipe writers because I'm not as OCD as a a lot of people are. You know, I, I, I sort of go with um, the way that people want to change recipes, but I make sure they work. I mean, otherwise, it's just your rest, you know, your reputation that's yeah. At stake. Yeah, you do relate one uh, flaky story from 2001 when the Times assigned you a, a oh, New yeah. York Times asked you to write a Rosh Hashanah story, and you did it about a challah, and and you, you know, this was your your calling in the story, calling in the story to the uh, to the Times on the phone, and someone at the paper transposes the quantities required of water and oil. Right. And suffice it to say, it was an it was an oily, it, it was there there was more oil there than was fit to print. Uh 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 which, which must have been terrible. Must have felt terrible. And and what I think somebody called it the Valdi's oil spill. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, everybody wanted to make bread at that time because it was a horrible time in our history. Um, and when they called me, it was heir of Rosh Hashanah. And we, Alan and I had been invited to the then ambassador, I forget who it was, for dinner. For, And I knew that I had, I had two hollows coming out of the oven when they called. And I said, well, if you get a photographer over, there'll be these great, uh, you know, hollas. And, but I, I knew my kids were coming home and I didn't want to, I said, I, w- I will not be able to talk to you after such and such a time. Cause I had promised my kids that I wouldn't let my food writing interfere with their coming home. And um, so, you know, I was under a lot of pressure and I quickly wrote a an article, probably a really good, it was a good article um, on, you know, the, the, the meaning of, of bread at mm-hmm. difficult times in your life. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the good thing about that was that the hala that was looked so beautiful was repeated in the, the, um, in the correction the next week because they got so many letters, but I like to keep all those letters. And I related a lot mm-hmm. of the letters Mm-hmm. in the book yeah um so that people could read it and it it didn't do you any damage in the long run <laughs> for, for one one person yeah, but but you know there there were times earlier on that it was my mistake i remember um there was and i relate this story there was a um shortbread recipe that was in the boston globe two pages color beautiful and i had said one fourth uh uh, and, wait a minute. Instead of a cup of flour, one fourth cup of flour. So, and that was my mistake. But you learn. I mean, you learn from your mistakes. And it, you know, it seems like, oh my God, I'll never get another uh, job again or whatever. But uh, you, you, you say about uh, writing your first cookbook, which was about about uh, food in Israel. 
uh, you now write, if you're writing a first cookbook, I recommend working with another person. It's so helpful to have someone to push you, and the project is not so lonely. But first, do editors count as other persons? And uh, talk about the loneliness of, uh, of uh, writing a book like that. Well, first of all, when you write your first book, you don't have an editor, unless you're some brilliant person. And I was an ordinary young person. Look, I was in my 20s, in my late 20s when I wrote that first book. And... Um, Doing it on your own, there. I remember there at, at the time in Jerusalem, there was a woman who was writing a book on Jerus on on food from England, on 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 Israel, and um, she said to to me and to this other woman, "Don't write a book. I'm writing a book." And uh, on you know, there, the world doesn't need two books on Israel. And a, a rabbi's wife came up to me. Um, who was in Israel at the time from Providence, from actually my rabbi's wife. And she said, there's always room for more than one book on a subject. And don't let that stop you. And, you know, it's true. And I've always thought about that. There are different approaches to anything so that who, you know, just don't worry about the other people. But when you're on your own, and now I have my, I have a wonderful editor now, and I had Judith Jones before. They were your allies. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have, if you didn't have that and you had no, you were on your own, you might abandon the prop project or you put it off for a while. But this way we had each other to work on it. And then after that, I was able to go on my own and do them on my own. Is there, there's a, a palpable difference between books nowadays uh, that uh, that come out about food and yeah. books that were in my, in my mother's kitchen. Uh, and one of the most striking things is just the artwork that accompanies a, a, a food book now. I mean, I don't think anybody would, uh, I mean, would two copies of the settlement uh, uh, whatever it is, a, 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 a cookbook. I mean, there. This wouldn't sell today. I think a book that looked like that. Well, well, it, it, I think that um, especially at Alfred Knopf, Judith Jones was totally opposed to any photographs. And if you look at um, Mastering the Art of French Cooking by Julia Child, no photos, hmm. no photos in Marcella Hazan's books or Madhur Joffrey's books. Maybe those, not even illustrations, really, not many, maybe designs, hmm. but, you know, the, all of these books. And it wasn't until I wrote, um, I mean, and the photographs, she never wanted professional photographs. My editor, Judith Jones, I don't think she wanted the, the cost Mm -hmm. for Alfred Knopf. So I, they were like patchworks. Because, because clearly we should say, these are gifted photographers who are taking these pictures. I mean, that's right. uh, exactly. serious uh, stuff. Yeah. The only, the only um, my first cookbook, The Flavor of Jerusalem, which was not Alfred Knopf, which was a little brown. Um, when, when I, um, what's his name? Uh <laughs> Anyway, this very famous photographer, Cornell Kappa, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. was visiting Jerusalem when I was writing the book. And he laughed and he said to me, ha, 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 if you get a publisher, I'll let my photographers from Magnum do the photographs. So I got a publisher and I got Mark Ribou and Ernst Haas and Cornell Kappa. They all did photographs in that first book because he had promised me. So, but those were black and white and they were a people, which is something I happen to like. Um, but it wasn't really until my Israeli cookbook that came out in 2001, I believe, that um, we hired a photographer and it was an Israeli photographer in Israel. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, and I think it, it, it was a good change. Yeah. And after that, Judith, again, 2005, my American cookbook, she just had a patchwork of of, rest, of photographs for me. And then she passed away. And, um, I, you know, I worked with um, Lexi Bloom on the last two books. And she put in King Solomon's Table gorgeous photography. Yes, yes. 
And the same photographer, Gabriella Herman, did the photographs in My Life and Recipes. I mean, doesn't that add to the the market of the cookbook as a gift to to to, to someone? Absolutely, especially in today's world, yeah. no question. And and it was fun having you know having these photographers. I mean, it's a lot of work because you've got to do all the recipes, and I, I had people help me with them. But you also have to write, have again the, the the right photographer whose vision is like your vision. You know, mine was to be very natural, and that's what she did. Many of the uh, of the recipes uh, that you describe come from. Uh, in some places, some fairly poor communities. Uh, I mean, the, the village outside Jerusalem uh, is, you know, is not um, Larchmont, where you, where you <laughs> right. spent part of your youth. Uh, and you once, in, at one point, you describe a, a friend of your son's, who the, the friend is an Ethiopian Jew, who obviously came from not only perilous, but but also fairly modest circumstances, showing how how they cooked a chicken in his where, where, where he grew up, uh, and it was very detailed. And uh, uh, and I wondered, is this, do you think it's it's a universal trait that uh, people prepare and heat and season foods in a particular way and and hand that trait down from generation to generation? Or do you have to be a sufficiently wealthy society to have developed something that... Uh, can be called a, a national cuisine? Um, I think it comes from both. Mm -hmm. I think there's, you know, there's celebratory um, meals where there will be m more intricate recipes. Um, in this Ethiopian's case, this poor food was also the food of the Jewish past. I could see it in early Iraqi recipes, um, in Uzbeki recipes, where you would take the skin of a chicken. The whole chicken was so dear. So, you know, just think about the protein that you would get from it. And um, they would sew them, the, out of the side of the, uh, the skin, and they'd fill it with rice and cook it um, inside a stew. And then you'd, you would eat the skin afterwards. You know, we throw the skin away a lot. You know, we're, and this is because we're from a, a different kind of a culture, but you know, you find dishes like rice dishes that are something that's everyday delicious food in these countries, bean dishes, um, something that, you know, we don't eat, we're beginning to eat them more and more. Um, different kinds like fricka and other kinds of grains that we're eating, but they're really important. And I, I you know, some of my friends from the vineyard still remember that meal mm -hmm. this Ethiopian made for us um, because we all sensed how, precious everything was to him and and then you can understand like um injera and teff how their you know the native native foods of of uh ethiopia and that you they would be developed through the years to become a cuisine and you know ethiopian cuisine is a wonderful example because it was the only totally independent except for a few years of um, Italian, um, yes. the Italians that came in during World War II, um, country in, in Africa. Yeah. So it definitely has a very marked cuisine. And it's a cuisine of basically of, of fasting and of eating. They have more fast days than any other country in the world. Um, you know, and they're beautiful people, but it's it's... You know, it, it is a cuisine and, you know, I mean, I'm not wild about it. I, I, there are some dishes I like a lot, but I, you know, injera takes a, is very sour and it's not my favorite mm -hmm. bread. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we both live in Washington where there are more Ethiopian restaurants than any place in the world. <laughs> right. Well, it's, yes. Someone, um, I remember somebody once proudly saying of my old 
uh, shop NPR that um, uh, we don't we're not just catering to the elite. I get into a cab driver anywhere in Washington. They're listening to NPR, and of course, most of the cab drivers had graduate degrees. They were Ethiopian immigrants or Eritrean immigrants, and they had graduate degrees, but were were driving a cab as as as, as immigrants. Um, well, well, the other thing I wanted to say about some of these cuisines, if you take Moroccan, for example, I yes. That there, there are villages in Morocco where, um, and Jewish families that will not share um, their salads outside the family because they're very proud of them. You mean the recipe, the 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 actual recipe, or the, or the dish? Yeah, no, the, the recipe for the because there are all these salads, like you know the the um, the Arabs and the Jew. Everybody in the Middle East has these. Lot, lots of um, little salads to start the like a meza to start the meal, and they they it, it's not just that it's all recipes they will not share now now perhaps in you know as things have changed but they wouldn't when they lived in these villages they were very very proud of them and they kept them within families. Um, but now, you know, I think it's all changed. Look, I mean, look at what, between the internet and everybody wanted to show what they did. But the, uh, there's another reason they would also not share them. I, I remember my aunt had a recipe called Gesundheitskuchen. It was a, like a lemony cake that she would make when, when, whenever somebody was either sick or dying or whatever to the family. And she'd bring it to the family. But my mother wanted the recipe and she would never give it to her. Um, she'd always leave something out. And I realized that what, what that is, is, is a different reason, not because you're proud of it. If you give that away and as you get older, maybe nobody will come visit you because they won't get that dish, whatever it is. And so people would keep it. And, and I learned that as a cookbook writer, I'd have to, you know, I'd have to work the recipe a little bit to get it from them. But they, when my aunt gave it the recipe to me, um, because she felt that I was going to make her immortal, it was going to be in a book. And that's different. I guess that gives her life forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was wondering, uh, while reading, you mentioned Morocco, I was wondering if you if you had to uh, subsist on the cuisine of only one country other than the United States. Uh, my rough sense is it's either Israel or Morocco is what I would imagine. But I, I what what would you say? Maybe Israel, Morocco, and France. I love and France. Oh, Italy. I mean, all of them. <laughs> Can I just take four? <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, it's it's very telling. I think that. Uh, you took a a master's in in French literature, and mm -hmm. you're considered, at least considered, going for for a doctorate. Your 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 master's essay was uh, uh, considered stuff that could be expanded into a dissertation, and uh, and I didn't know that you were a fan of Proust. Who my finally read in retirement, uh, knowing knowing the little cliches, but finally actually reading the the uh, uh, in search of uh, uh, in search of lost time, as we now say. Um, and of course, the, the the one cliched moment that everybody who hasn't read Proust uh, knows about is is the 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 memories that are inspired by the young Marcel, the narrator, uh, from meeting a Madeleine. And um, and it's a link between memory and memoir and life and the memory of it of a taste of a food, um, which uh, I know that wasn't what you wrote your. Your 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 master's essay about, but it but it seemed to uh, the 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 connection to Proust somehow seems very logical that you should be a lover of Proust. Well, didn't you love reading it? Yes, yes, absolutely. And reading it when you're older. Yeah. Yes. Well. Yes. Because I I read that and I read um, War and Peace recently, and I just loved both of them, and I read Proust clearly differently. From when I was a young girl, but you know, I I did write my master's on the image of Esther in the work of Proust and how Esther became a boy, a man that she ate um, something that was a fried dough, 
Um, his mother was a Jew. She was married to a, 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 a doctor who was not Jewish. So it's sort of all I could. And the, one of their favorite games was um, taking the uh, Racine play of Esther and reading lines from it to each other. You know, and it's it just all, and and the, and it sort of Albert became Albertine, and it just the fluidity of life. It, it was really very very interesting. But but the big thing was that I learned is that the Madeleine was not really a Madeleine at the beginning. That it was sort of like a Rusk, or maybe like a Mandelbrot. It was something that was a little bit harder than a Madeleine, but the editor did not think that that was something that was sexy enough. And so he <laughs> turned it into a Madeleine. <laughs> so, so, so the editor, he was just responsible for that Madeleine thing. Right. Yeah. You, uh, you write in the book uh, about uh, the move, I guess, from Larchmont to Providence when you were a kid. And uh, you describe watching your, your mother. I see, you write, as I sat on the chest freezer watching her cook, uh, I learned that enjoying the daily process of living, including cooking, is what counts most in life. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted you to, to talk about that. About that well, I, you know, I think it's the daily process of living, not just cooking. When, but when you're cooking, you know, people are hanging out at your in your kitchen. They're taking part of it. Um, right now, for example, I have a, a young girl from Ukraine living with me. And when she first came, which was last week, she's going to be here all summer. Um, we, we made, uh, uh, um, you know, dumplings with cherry that her mother would make and Veronica's and we did them together and it and for for Shabbat dinner and it, it just broke down for her she was so proud of doing it it was so much fun to I love making dumplings it's a lot of fun mm. and um you know and everybody enjoyed eating what she made but the point is that's hanging around a table is and and cooking together is really that's what life is all about. It's it's doing these little things like walking and I don't know having friendships and mm -hmm. gardening. It's not making tons of money, that kind of thing. That to me is not really living. Well, listen, I've enjoyed uh, this bit of living with you. Uh, <laughs> I I think there there are people who've been who've been watching and listening, who will have some questions for you now. So, uh, Joan, thanks a lot. And I'm going to hand us back to Suzanne Borden. Anytime, Robert. You know I love being with you. Well, it's great to be with you. Great. Suzanne? Thank yes, thank you both. Uh, so some questions from the audience. Um, you had a TV show at one point. Uh, what did you enjoy about that? And what was the most difficult part of being on a show, your own cooking show? Uh, well, I loved giving all these people, a, this was called Jewish Cooking in America with Joan Nathan. It was based on my book, Jewish Cooking in America, which came out in 1974. And um, was a book, I, I believe book and the show sort of changed the way people looked at Jewish food in America. And I know Forward, when last year, did two years ago, did something where they said there were 125 people that changed America. And one of them was me for 1974 for this book. And I had never thought about it till somebody who was writing about me um, just recently said, mentioned to me, I thought, you know, they're right. But what for me, these were people like uh, there was a woman named Doris Sagalnik who made gefilte fish, and she still remembered from Russia what it was like. And she was lived in uh, Dayton, Ohio. And the way that she, you know, the, the humanity of, in this woman, the way that she made these dishes, and, or another woman, uh, um, Jean, June Salander, and, and they're all gone now, in um, Vermont. 
and you know her 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 dishes, her hala, and it just gave them a platform. These were these were women that had never cooked before. Um, that was the greatest pleasure for me was to giving them, uh, to putting them in the sun in the star stardom. The worst part of it, and Robert must have this too, was the waiting, the endless waiting. Um, while things were set up, it just, I, I really didn't, that I did not like, you know, you spend days on it. And I, I've sp spoken to other people who would agree with that. Thank you. Uh, is there a particular Jewish dish that is still relatively unknown that you think more people uh, should know about and we should be cooking? Well, there, yeah, there's a the dish that's in, that I put, in this book, um, in, um, my life and recipes, but I also had a, a variation of it in King Solomon's table. That it's a it's a dish that's made at at Passover from the island of Corfu, and most of the Jews of Corfu were killed during the Holocaust because they just whisked them off to the um, to, to the ovens. Anyway. Um, and this is a dish where you cook the eggs like huevos jaminados. That's the way I do them uh, for a long time. And I cook them in, in coffee rinds and other different coffee grains and other um, onion rings. Um, and I cook them for maybe, I don't know, many hours. And then what I do is, you know, in, at Passover, Eastern European Jews have a... Um, they they want to make like a cold water soup and they put a hard boiled egg in it. I put these eggs in it. And then in this old Corfuian recipe, um, you you cook spinach or Swiss chard, different greens, and you serve it together with on, red onions. It's really absolutely delicious. And the first time I made it for our Passover Seder, um, I remember my daughter-in-law said, this has to which for the other dish. So we no longer just have a cold water soup. And it's, there are lots of dish, dishes like that that we're finding, especially now with so many people coming from Ukraine and from other places with their little known recipes that have disappeared from our tables and that curious culinary people um, are bringing them back. Thank you. Uh, which Jewish recipe do you feel especially brings love and connections to people? Well, I would say challah, a good, there's nothing like a good challah. Um, people always smile when they know that it's going to be homemade and it's not very hard to make it yourself. And it's one of the mitzvot that you're supposed, that a woman is supposed to do for Shabbat. And I, you know, I just think it feels good in your hands. You get used to it. Um, the other one I think is chicken soup with matzo balls. Um, but you know, when, and, and it makes you feel good. Even when I, when I'm sick, of course I like it, but I also like, um, a, a, you know, a, a, what do you call it? Um, Vietnamese chicken soup or Ethiopian, not Ethiopian, um, Yemenites chicken soup. Those, you know, but but mostly regular. And I put um, fresh ginger and nutmeg in my matzo balls. I will say my college uh, age son, uh, before school ended for the semester, he was going to a potluck and he asked, it was right around uh, Passover and he asked, what should he bring? And we said, how about matzo ball soup? And we told him how to make it. And he brought matzo ball soup to a bunch of college students who weren't Jewish. And uh, he was very proud of that. Oh, great. I love that. And, and Joan, uh, you might point out that um, for your taste, the matzo balls you make are, as you say, al dente. Right. That's right. They're not <laughs> good. <laughs> read my book. Not sinkers and not floaters. <laughs> <laughs> What's the most memorable food experience you had around the world, whether it was making food or enjoying the food, Jewish or not Jewish? Oh, well, uh, recently I had an experience, it was just last summer in Italy. Um, they have these, in uh, Ancona, Italy, they have these um, caves 
that they're right, like 500 caves that have been made into kitchens, sort of kitchens, but they're still caves on the beach. And I went with this Italian woman that I know, and she said, I want to make pasta with you on the beach in the caves. So I went with somebody else with actually a, a chef from Washington and we went there and we watched her. And what was so interesting was, I mean, it wasn't primitive, primitive, but it was, you know, it was really good pasta that she made it, but because it was on the beach, everybody kept coming over to either share something they had made or because she was a very well-known pasta maker, getting something from her. And it was such an unusual experience. I'd never had one quite like it. Mm -hmm. um, for those who may be interested in writing their own cookbook, do you suggest just coming up with random recipes? Should there be a theme to the book? How do you approach it? Well, I, what I would say to and what I'd say to people is go to a bookstore or to a library, look at what cookbooks are there that you might want to do it. And look at the way the, the graphics of them are. And as, as Judith Jones would say, my editor, who was like the editor, um, see what you want to make a contribution. You don't want to duplicate what somebody else has done. You know, like if somebody said, well, I want to do my family recipes, well then do it in a limited way because, you know, who's going to care really about your family recipes? There has to be a bigger theme to it, but it, it shouldn't be all over the place. You know, you're not going to write the joy of cooking or, um, you know, uh, Mark Bittman's every, what everybody wants to, whatever he, he did. But anyway, uh, you, you have to have a point of view and just stick to it. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody wanted to know if the recipe you talked about from your grandmother, the Gesundheit, I don't remember the Kuching. Do you have that in any um, of your books? Uh, yeah, the Gesundheit Kuchen, I don't believe it's in this. A lot of my, in, in this book, there are lots of recipes, updated recipes from throughout my life, like the famous apple, Jewish apple cake, um, my father's uh, Svechkin Kuchen, which was blue plum um, Kuchen, which I still I still think I love Marion Burroughs, but I think this recipe is a better recipe um, for Rosh Hashanah. I would never tell her, but she might be listening. Um, but I, you know, I love this this cake so much, and a lot. There's another one that I love, and that. I was very happy that a lot of people have been making this. this is, there's a sweet and sour fish recipe um, with ginger, with ginger snaps for my German family. And I've played around with it to make it a little bit more modern. And it's really, really good. And that's what we always have for, um, you know, for Rosh Hashanah. Did you ever get the full recipe from your grandmother? And did you include it in any of the books? Uh, for what? The, the, the I, Gesundheit? Oh, well, the, uh, let me just tell you. One of the things that I did, yes, I have it. It's in Jewish Holiday Kitchen and the updated Jewish Holiday Kitchen. And also what I do do, and I recommend this to anybody who's working with an elderly parent or somebody or an aunt or, an, or a grandmother, is to bring um, measuring spoons and measuring cups when they're cooking and don't go out of the room <laughs> because they'll cheat. They'll tell you. They <laughs> yeah, I, I have a lot of my grandmother's recipe books written in like a binder and it just says a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Right. I don't know how to make it. And we don't cook that way anymore. So right. what I mean, what when I have gotten recipes like that, I've looked... Um, and actually I'm working on a project I'll tell you about in a second. I look at other books to see what people that have really tested recipes, what they do. And, uh, and that's worked very well for me. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the project that you're working on. Well, you know, I haven't really started. It's not, not a book or it probably will be a book. It's with the Leo Beck Institute and it's taking, I have about six, um different cookbooks for my family and that and I've met other people that from actually one woman 
I had a lot of my aunt's recipes in it with her name. It was really weird. So the people that have handwritten cookbooks um, from a certain period and, um, you know, a, a lot of these people died in the Holocaust from whatever country they were. These are Middle, East, Middle European, middle-class women who had recipes that didn't necessarily bake the recipes at home as, as in, in memory's kitchen in a way. Um, but they made the recipes. So I'm trying to see what, how different they are from family to family, if there's a difference and trying to write some of them, you know, produce something with all, a lot of them. And I think it's going to be really interesting. Like everybody had a, a recipe for Sacher tort, everyone. Hmm. Um, even though he was not Jewish, even though some people say he was, he was not Jewish. Um, he had a Jewish daughter-in-law, but he wasn't Jewish. But so that, you know, that, that people want to make these recipes. Um, and that's, you know, that's what I, and when I was sort of um, going through one book, I found um, a recipe for berges. And that's in my book, which was a, um, a caraway potato bread, which is a challah. Berges means twisted or braided. And it's delicious. It's so different. And it, it started um, when Count Rumford went to Bavaria. And this was when, uh, uh, you know, just before World War One, and when potatoes came in and um, potatoes were cheaper. So I think that they started using potatoes in Halle in Germany, but it made it sort of, um, it, it, it made it softer and um, it stayed, even though they didn't need to do it anymore. And my guess is it was caraways and it's braided differently from other halas. And I, it was different from an, another hala that I had from a different village from where another part of my family came in southern Germany. So I'm on. Yeah. yeah um, we're, about to wrap, we're about to wrap up. Um, yeah. Just just people want to know, uh, somebody just wrote in and said that your grandmother's recipe is in the Jewish Holiday Kitchen book, and it's on page 368 for anybody <laughs> who would like. So, so thank you, Susan. Um, just real quickly, two more uh, quick questions. One is, um, are there any particular Jewish... Um, cooks now that we should up and coming that we should all know and um, be following? Oh, there's a woman in Italy. Well, she lives in London, but she's done an Italian cookbook that I think is marvelous, Silvia um, Nakamuli. And she's from an old Italian family. And I know the recipes are quite, quite wonderful. Um, and you should definitely follow her. And um, then- Yeah, and, and you know, um, Adina Sussman is very good. Um, Jake uh, Cohen is very good. You know, there are a lot of, a, a huge number that are coming up. Great. And, and lastly, uh, next week we celebrate Shavuot. Is there a particular dairy recipe that you would highly recommend for people to make? Oh, there's a, well, let's see, in this book, I don't know, there are just a lot of them. Um, Oh yeah, there, there's there's a delicious soup, and it's from Lydia Bastianich. Um, it's with ricotta cheese and peas, and and it's very much like the spring soup that my mother in law would make, but she didn't put which I have in the other books, which is potatoes and peas and leeks. But this is just delicious. Great. Well, everybody, uh, her Joan's book, new book is My Life in Recipes. I put a link in the chat. I will send a follow-up email and we'll include a link to uh, both the book and Joan's website. Joan, thank you so much. Thank you, Robert. Thank, thank you to the you. audience. Please go to momentmag.com where you can register for our program on Thursday and watch a documentary uh, about the, the program, uh, The Nightclub, Mr. Kelly's. And uh, we'll see everybody next time. Thank you both. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Joan. Goodbye, Robert.